All right, so my name is Melody Mendoza, and I'm a student at Texas State working on the South by Texas State project. And this is pretty much what we do is we preview panels before South by Southwest. And so today I am here with Larry Vincent, and he's the executive director of UTA Brand Studio. And um, if you can just tell us a little bit about what you do and what UTA Brand Studio does. Um, so on his bio, some of the, things, the brands that he's um, worked on is Disney, Coca-Cola, MasterCard, so some of the really big ones that we know of. Um, but yeah, so what's your background and what does UTA Studio do? Sure. So Brand Studio, UTA Brand Studio is a, uh, is a brand strategy and design firm. So our focus is usually on one of, uh, and some more than one thing, uh, four things. So we do a lot of research. We do strategic work for major brands. And uh, we also do, we name things, uh, figure out like what you call something and when, when you're launching a new product or a new company. And then we do a lot of uh, graphic design and creative development around the look and feel of brands. Um, and some clients, we do all of the above. Some, it's just focused on a specific area. Great. Um, so what was your experience or role working with some of those large, larger brands that um, you have on your bio? Well, it's very different. You know, every brand, the thing we often say about brands is that they're not just, um, you know, about a slogan or a logo. There's, it's also about the culture and it's about what is true about the brand and how that, um, there may or may not be a disconnect between what's true about the brand and, and what people perceive about it. So every brand we work with, I'd say, is quite different because their cultures are different. And, you know, whether you're working with someone like Coca-Cola or you're working with someone like Microsoft, uh, very different cultures, very different ways of making decisions, and uh, very different relationships that, that people have with those brands. Awesome. So, and your bio says that you've developed strategy. So you um, do more of the pre-work, kind of the research on um, the target audience, or what, what, is the, what do you do specifically, I guess? Sure. So you can think about the work that we do as we often say it's foundational branding work. And uh, the way that, you know, I think one of the challenges that's out there is everybody says they do branding, but a lot of times when you dig a little deeper, um, it's related to brands, but it's not branding. So for example, you might uh, talk to a PR company that says they do branding. Really what they're doing is thinking about how to message around a brand idea or an advertising company is doing campaigns around a brand idea. And what we do is far more upstream. So we're usually working with CEOs and chief marketing officers heads of the branding teams, when they're actually trying to, to solve some very serious challenges that um, span every part of the business. I often say that the best, uh, the worst disservice to the world of word branding is that we always think it's connected to marketing. Uh, some of the most important work we do is with uh, research and development and product development, human resources, when people are trying to think about, you know, we have brands we work with, a lot of them that are going to be at South by Southwest, that are constantly on the drive to find uh, quality by employees and be able to recruit and retain uh, really talented people and the brand matters in that. Um, so when we when you think about the stuff that we do in the decisions, it's really working with those teams to define what the brand is, what does it stand for, and then how you execute that against that, whether it's um, something as tactile, it's tactile as, um, as a name or a logo or uh, the design of a, of a digital environment or even the design of a building. Um, and then sometimes it's, it's far more conceptual and strategic, which is what's the look and feel we generally want people to experience when they interact with this brand. Awesome. So where do you, where do you start when you want to create a brand? Well, when you want to create a brand, um, that's a good question. You know, I'd say that the three kinds of projects that we typically take on, uh, one is somebody wants to launch a new brand. Uh, the other two that are more pr predominant for us is there's a brand that's lost its way and you've got to help it get back on track. Or it's a brand that's doing very well, but competitors are coming into the market and they want to figure out how to stay ahead of the game. When you're trying to launch a new brand, I'd say that that sometimes is one of the hardest challenges because you don't have anything to rely on historically. So you can't go back and say, you know, we tried this, it didn't work, but maybe there's a new way to do it. So we always go back to the things that we know are proof points and are true about, uh, about the, the product or the service or the company that's being branded. And then we look generally at the audience that they want to reach. So, um, you know, that audience isn't just customers or consumers. It can be employees. It can be investors. And what we try to understand are what are their unmet needs? How does the brand ad address those needs? What makes it different and distinctive? Um, and then the third part, part of it is how do they operate? So this is particularly uh, a difficult one to measure when it's a brand new company. It's a startup. You have a lot of very early stage companies in South by Southwest. And so you don't have that history of corporate culture to understand 
uh, how the brand needs to interact with them. You have to really go off of the personalities of the founders and the, the critical employees. Because what we found is if you can't execute against that brand idea and the culture, then it's going to fail. Okay. And so your upcoming panel is titled Followers Attached, and you're going to be talking about brand attachment. So how do you create brand attachment? What are some of the things that you think of when you're creating a brand that's going to help people really attach to that brand and, and find that brand loyalty? Sure. So attachment is an under uh, leveraged part of the branding literature right now. People don't talk about it enough. We talk about how much we think a brand should be. Somebody would recommend them to somebody else. We talk about this kind of ambiguous concept of preference, which goes back to thinking about when I go and I'm in the shopping aisle, uh, I don't have to think. I just prefer that brand. I don't go through a whole laundry list of decision making criteria. Attachment is a whole other part, a dimension to this, which is how much do I see that brand as being like me or unlike me? And how easily and effortlessly do thoughts and feelings about the brand come to mind? In other words, do I have to take a moment to think about how I feel about it? Or when you say the brand name or I see the logo or I sense the experience, do I just automatically am I flooded with thoughts and feelings about that brand? Um, so we started uh, doing some work with this. We partnered with um, professors from uh, just down the street from us at USC at the Marshall School of Business who have published several papers on attachment. And it's a much better predictor of behavior. Um, so what, we, what we're going to be sharing at South by Southwest is some recent work that we've done on brands, many brands that are attending the conference, and also a lot of technology brands. We'll, we'll specifically be looking at a lot of social uh, media services. Uh, and what is it that makes people want to use one of those services over another, where they just, you know, they see themselves as more a Twitter person or more of a Facebook person? Uh, your question is, like, how do you build that? And it really comes back to those two key things, which is, how much, when you're, when you're creating a brand, it's not just thinking about what it does functionally, and it's not just thinking about what that campaign looks like, but trying to give your target audience something where they either see that, you know, where they start to see that as an extension of who they are. It shares their values. Uh, it is very much um, something that they would be proud to tell others about because it, it, they identify with it. Um, and that, you know, depending on the audience you're going after, it is a very important piece of that puzzle. If, if you're primarily creating a corporate brand that's going to be going out to investors and, and uh, employees but maybe isn't going to show up on the product, then the values you're going to be thinking about there may be very different than the, the, what you would attach to the brand that's part of the product. Awesome. And so, I mean, I'm sure you're going to talk about this a little bit. Just, um, how, does, how has technology played a role in brand attachment, how, specifically social media? Like when people talk about that brand online, like um, you don't, I mean, they don't, they, nobody told them to, nobody's paying them to, to do that or pay them to uh, give a testimony on a commercial, but they're on social media and they're, I love Coca-Cola or something like that. How has that played a role in, in you know, what you think of now? Well, you know, it's interesting that so I think a lot of people in the marketing community sometimes discount what they see in social media. We look at sentiment, is it positive or negative? We look at the volume. But when you talk to a lot of marketers about what well, people say these things in social media, and they don't know whether or not they can trust it because they don't know if people are grandstanding or if it really is a true depiction of what they feel. And a good example of that is, you know, someone going onto Facebook and saying, you know, I look horrible today and posting a selfie. And then they know that somebody's going to reach in and say, no, you look great. They're kind of fishing for it. So, you know, sometimes marketers look when you, when you name check a brand, are you hoping that the brand interacts with you? And then so you're saying something to maybe get something or to say something to your friends. But the research has told us, though, actually, is uh, those social things, because you know your friends are watching and there are others that keep you in check, are often very valid um, indicators of how people feel about a brand. And if you're looking at that social, you know, you're talking about technology in general, when we think about social in particular, when people start to talk about brands as a way of, of saying something about themselves, uh, that's, a, that's an indicator of attachment. It's not the only one, but it's one that you want to look for uh, because people may have a sense of pride. Uh, the flip side of attachment is aversion, and you probably see more of this on social than you do on attachment where people, you know, feel they have to dis a brand. Yeah. Uh, in order to separate themselves from it. And uh, I give an example in, in my book about a friend of mine who you know, hated Ed Hardy. And every time he saw Ed Hardy, he was like, he recoiled. But he wanted to make it very clear to people that that was not a brand that, he, that shared his values. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to kind of get off of the kind of South by talk, talk, uh, topic and talk a little bit about just you in general and um, what you find interesting, I guess. So what was a brand that you helped create that was the most fun to work on? Oh, that's hard. It's like saying, which is your favorite child? <laughs> it's 
Uh, so I don't know if I can answer that question and not get in trouble. I would say that you know, we work on a lot of great brands. I started my career at Disney, and for five years, that was a very fascinating experience because, um, and it kind of led to the work that I've done in the last few years around attachment because people had such a connection to the brand. And um, for me, it was very interesting. I, I was in a, sat in a position where I was able to um, interact with almost every part of Disney's universe. It wasn't just theme parks. It wasn't just the movies. It wasn't just consumer products. But you got to see the way that um, families really related to the brand. And um, I've never worked on a brand since. Well, that's not true. I mean, some of the brands like ESPN is a very similar one, where people just have this very strong sense of connection for better or worse with it. Um, so that definitely was fun. And you, you felt a sense, you know, that being at Disney, we all felt a responsibility. Like we, you know, we were you know, stewardship that we had to have in terms of protecting that brand. So that was a pretty, pretty cool experience. Awesome. And oh, so not everybody, on the flip side, I guess, not everybody talks about their failures, but what was a brand that maybe didn't take off as, you know, as planned? And what did you learn from that experience? And maybe what could you tell businesses that maybe are not doing so well in their branding area? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, when I look back, I think usually when we have an issue where there's a brand that didn't take off the way that we hoped, it always, like 99% of the time, comes down to the execution and the, the, the ability of the team to execute against it. So I think some of the ones that come to mind right away is, you know, we worked with a company a few years back, uh, and, and our process of getting to the idea is very immersive. You know, we spend time, we do stakeholder interviews with senior decision makers, both inside and outside the company. Um, and, and often do consumer research, field our own research. So this was a pretty robust activity. Um, and people, you, you, we sensed right away that there was not a lot of commitment or consensus inside the organization to a rebranding effort. Um, so this was an area where they, after a lot of time, it was like sort of the, the it's kind of like what we have in the government right now, right? Nobody really agreed, but they sort of uh, got to compromise. Nobody liked the compromise. They didn't commit to it. And so even though they spent a lot of effort on the rebrand, it kind of fizzled out. And that was, that was because they just, you didn't have the internal audience really believing in it and committed to it. They'd been through three rebrands in five years. Wow. So everybody was kind of fatigued. Uh, and I think that's something that everybody should think about. You know, this is a corporate rebrand I'm talking about. But even on a product brand, um, you really have to have people inside the organization believing in it, understanding what it is, and knowing how to execute against it in order for it to be successful. Great. That's, that's awesome. So that's all the questions I have. Um, do you have anything else to say about your panel? Maybe what um, you uh, will be talking about or something that people should know beforehand? Well, I think one thing that would be interesting for us is uh, we're hoping to have some discussion at the end of it. We shared, uh, we've shared some of this data a few times. We have our partner, USAMP, has been working with us, and we're fielding some really interesting research. If people will have specific questions about how people attach to brands, why they attach to brands, and, and even specific brand examples, We'd love to hear about them. You can get me on Twitter at L. Vincent, and um, I'd be happy to, to think about some of those things and be prepared to talk about them when we come into the room. Great. Thank you so much for your time and speaking with me today. You.